Hi, and welcome to chapter 16. In this chapter, we're talking about gene expression, how we control whether or not genes are off or on. Previously, we learned that every body cell or somatic cell in an organism contains the full genome of the organism. So in humans, for example, we know that we have 46 chromosomes and we have all of those genes in those chromosomes present in every body cell, my skin cells, cells of my eye, etc. But we know that those cells look different. My skin cells look different from the cells of my liver, look different from neurons, etc. And this is because our genes are not all expressed simultaneously in every cell. And that would take way too much energy actually to maintain. So regulating which genes are expressed maintains efficiency in the body and in the in individual cells in terms of energy. So we save a ton of energy by not expressing all of our genes. It saves space because I know that DNA has to be unwound from those histone proteins in order to transcribe and translate the DNA to messenger RNA and proteins. So this saves space as well. And then of course time. Genes are only expressed when needed so that this can occur more rapidly. We're not trying to express every single gene in each cell. As I mentioned earlier, all the somatic cells in the body pretty much contain the same DNA, but cells look different from one another because they express different genes. So again, they exhibit differential gene expression. There are some exceptions. One major exception is in mature red blood cells, mature red blood cells, there is no nucleus, there's no DNA. And this is because they contain a protein called hemoglobin that binds oxygen and they need a lot of this packed inside each red blood cell, but you'll learn more about this in a future biology class. Looking at all the different cells or different types of tissues in our body though, only the specialized proteins that make up each body part are expressed. For example, in the eye over here, only specialized proteins that make up the eye and the parts of the eye are expressed in the eye. The same thing goes for the liver and the pancreas. Only the proteins that are used in that organ are going to be expressed in that area or in that organ. So at any given time, only a subset of all the genes encoded by our DNA are expressed and translated into proteins. And that subset really depends on what um, organ or what body part you're looking at. Ultimately, this gives rise to all of the different parts of our body that are in the living organism. So we learned in chapter 15 that transcription and translation occur differently in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, like bacteria, we remember that there is no nucleus. So everything happens in the cytoplasm, both transcription and translation during gene expression. So as soon as your messenger RNA is produced, ribosomes can bind to the messenger RNA and begin translation of the mRNA into your polypeptide. In eukaryotes, however, because of the presence of the nucleus, transcription and translation are separated. First, you take DNA and make your messenger RNA. Then that mRNA has to be shuttled to the cytoplasm before translation can occur. So this process of going from DNA to messenger RNA and then to protein is called gene expression. And this is a very complicated process and it's regulated at different levels depending if you're looking at a prokaryotic cell like bacteria or if you're looking at eukaryotes. Since these occur, since transcription and translation occurs pretty much at the same time for prokaryotes, regulation of gene expression really occurs at the transcriptional level for these prokaryotes. So it really occurs here. In eukaryotes, since it's much more complicated, we're going to see that uh, the control or regulation of gene expression is going to occur at many different stages within the cell. So if we look at regulation of gene expression in eukaryotes, again, remember that transcription and translation are physically separated by that nucleus, that nuclear membrane in eukaryotes and our gene expression is gonna occur at many different stages. It can occur in terms of the epigenetic level, and this is where we're going to control 
how tightly DNA is wrapped around those histone proteins. So again, control can occur at the epigenetic level. Control can be, um, control of gene regulation can occur at the transcriptional level through transcription factors. It can even occur at the post-transcriptional level, and this would be during that RNA processing from pre-messenger RNA to your mRNA. Remember, we splice out the introns, add a five prime G cap and that poly A tail to the three prime end. It can, the gene expression regulation can occur during translation, or it can even occur after translation, and we call that post-translational regulation. This picture from our book shows a little bit more detail in terms of where gene expression can be regulated, the different steps that we can regulate. So we can regulate our chromatin through chromatin modifications. We've learned a little bit about DNA methylation and histone acetylation from the article that we read and from previous chapters. So I know methylation usually silences DNA expression or gene expression by um, making DNA wrap more tightly around those histone proteins. In contrast, histone acetylation loosens how tightly the DNA is wrapped around histone proteins, making it more accessible. We can make sure that DNA is not available for transcription if we want to methylate the DNA and silence the gene. Again, we can regulate the post-transcriptional messenger RNA. We can maybe stop some of that processing. Or once we've made messenger RNA, before we translate it into protein, we could potentially degrade our messenger RNA so it's not going to be read and produced into a polypeptide. We can modify our polypeptide. This would be a post-translational effect or post-translational regulation. Um, so that it doesn't get to its final destination, or we can even break down our protein so that it doesn't have its final function if we don't want it to have that function. And this is a table, table 16.1 from our book, that's really helpful in terms of looking at the gene expression differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So remember, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, whereas eukaryotes do. DNA is found in the cytoplasm or nucleoid of prokaryotes, whereas in eukaryotes, it's usually inside the nucleus. Although remember, we do have some DNA in our mitochondria and chloroplasts of plants. In prokaryotes, transcription and translation pretty much happen at the same time. Whereas in eukaryotes, this is not possible because transcription happens inside the nucleus and then translation occurs in the cytoplasm. And in prokaryotes, we thought we saw in the previous slide that we usually regulate gene expression at the transcriptional level. Whereas in eukaryotes, it occurs at many different levels. It's much more complicated. We can have epigenetic regulation, transcriptional regulation, um, whether or not we move the messenger RNA out of the nucleus. We can have regulation occur at post-transcriptional, uh, sorry, post-transcriptional, translational, and post-translational levels as well, as seen in the previous picture. So the first thing we're going to look at are examples of prokaryotic gene regulation, which, remember, occurs at the transcriptional level. And before we can dive into that, we kind of have to talk about how prokaryotic genes are expressed in the first place. Remember, prokaryotic DNA is found in the nucleoid region of the cytoplasm, which is usually somewhere in the middle of the cell. And interestingly, for prokaryotes, a single messenger RNA molecule can actually encode genes for several different proteins. And this is in contrast to eukaryotes, where one mRNA usually means one protein. In prokaryotes, since we have several different genes in one messenger RNA molecule, these blocks, these organized blocks, are known as operons. So this could be, for example, an operon for some kind of uh, functional pathway in the cell. Operons are regulated by three different molecule types. We have repressors that will block or suppress transcription. We have activators that will enhance or increase transcription. And then we have something known as inducers 
that can either suppress or activate transcription, really depending on what the cell needs at the moment or whether or not the substrate for the reaction is available or not. So again, in prokaryotes, let me redraw that messenger RNA. We have these genes, usually several, and it's not always three, I'm just fitting three into this line here. And these genes that are involved in the same biochemical pathway, same, I'll just put pathway, that are organized into operons, and they're regulated by these different types of molecules. So if I look at each of these, um, the repressors that we said suppress transcription, they're going to bind to a region in the operon known as the operator, operator region. Activators, in contrast, that increase transcription are going to bind to the promoter region or the promoter site. And both of these will be upstream or before the genes or that biochemical pathway. So usually the operator will be somewhere over here and the promoter will be even upstream from that. So our first detailed exploration of the operon is going to be the tryptophan operon. And tryptophan is an amino acid that we find in our proteins. In prokaryotes, like bacteria, uh, such as E. coli, to make tryptophan, you need five enzymes to do so. And the five genes that encode those enzymes are found here. So here is my operon. Here are my five genes, trip A through trip E, that are going to be transcribed. So the operon is DNA. So this whole thing, I should say, this whole thing is DNA. That'll be transcribed into messenger RNA containing those five genes. And then eventually those will be translated to those five enzymes to produce tryptophan. Since tryptophan is an amino acid that's incorporated into a variety of proteins, usually this operon is going to be on. So when you have too much tryptophan, however, and you don't need to make more, you don't want to waste your time and space and energy to do so, then you're going to turn it off. The gene, will, the gene expression will be turned off, and we call that switching the operon off. But if you don't have tryptophan, or if you have very little tryptophan in the cell, you're going to turn on the operon. You're going to begin gene expression of these five genes that encode the enzymes to produce tryptophan. So again, usually this operon is going to be on because you constantly need tryptophan to be incorporated into your proteins. But when you have too much tryptophan, you're going to turn off the operon. So this is why we call it a repressible operon. The default state is on, and you're going to turn it off when you have too much tryptophan. So let's write default is on, and it turns off again if you have too much tryptophan and you don't need to make more. So how does this regulation occur? So let's look at the different regions of the operon again. We have our coding region, where our genes are located. This is the coding region. We have our operator, where earlier I mentioned repressors bind to. And we have our promoter region that activators bind to, but RNA polymerase, the enzyme that reads DNA and produces messenger RNA, is going to bind to promoters too, as we saw earlier in chapter 15. So we have our transcriptional start site is going to be somewhere in the promoter region as we learned in chapter 15. It turns out that when you have plenty of tryptophan, you're not going to want to make enzymes to produce more tryptophan because that would be a waste of your time and energy. So when you have a lot of tryptophan, tryptophan actually binds to the repressor protein and allows it to bind to the operator region. It turns out that when the repressor protein is by itself, if I have a repressor protein by itself, without tryptophan, the shape is such that it cannot bind to the operator. But when tryptophan binds to the repressor protein, it changes its shape so it's optimized to bind to the operator region. 
having the tryptophan plus repressor complex bind to the operator results in a physical blockage so that RNA polymerase cannot move forward to transcribe these five genes. So it physically blocks, again, RNA polymerase. When there's no tryptophan, however, there will be no tryptophan to bind to the repressor protein. The repressor will not have the optimal shape to bind to the operator region, so it will fall off of the operator, and now there is no physical roadblock and polymerase, RNA polymerase, I should say, is free to move forward and transcribe the five genes that are responsible for producing the enzymes that will synthesize more tryptophan. So tryptophan is known as a negative regulator because it's going to allow the repressor protein to bind to the operator and silence transcription. So in this case, I would say tryptophan is a negative regulator and the repressor protein that it binds to. Again, this is called a repressible operon because the default state will be on. Tryptophan will be produced so that it can be incorporated into the different proteins that we have in our cell. And this is a really nice way for cells to regulate themselves because when there is no tryptophan or not enough tryptophan available, the operon is on and genes are expressed to make tryptophan. But if there's too much, it will self-regulate by binding to the repressor, blocking RNA polymerase by having the repressor bind to the operator and inhibiting transcription. Once you run out of tryptophan, we're gonna see this state. So it constantly goes back and forth and um, really to regulate how much tryptophan we have in our cell. And that takes us to the end of our first video. For our second video in chapter 16, we're going to look at the lactose operon as well as epigenetic regulation.